Um, welcome everybody, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, teachers. Um, welcome to Swans University. Um, welcome back to some of the people that I've seen this week already. So I want to say hello to St. Vega and St. John's School. Uh, I can see um, Mrs. In the, in the attendees, uh, Samantha Higgs, so welcome back. Um, today, you're going to be joining me, um, taking a trip right down to small scales. And so it's quite hard actually to understand um, some of the sort of the, the scale that we're thinking of today and how small these things actually are. So I've got a few slides to show you right at the start to try and explain like how zoomed in we're going to go today. So I know as well that the start of the British Science Festival that Chris um, set some activities on Friday. So hopefully you've been out doing your scavenger hunt over the weekend. We've had some requests uh, in for me to have a look at some stuff under the microscope. And so um, see, if, I won't tell you what they are. I'll see if you can guess them. So plenty of interaction on the chat, plenty of guesses in this sort of Q&A. So um, what I want you to do when I'm zoomed in on some of these um, samples is try and guess what they are first, and then I'll zoom out. And then we'll chat a little bit about how they look and about how important they are for engineering and science ideas. OK, so first of all, I'm going to show you what I mean by small things. So hopefully you can see my opening slide. And there's this picture there of a, the, the head of a bug. OK, and we're actually going to go even smaller than this today. Um, so, a little bit about myself. My name is Dr. Mark. I'm from Swansea University, and I work with Chris and everybody, as you can see here in the panelists, as part of Discover Materials. So, we're a group of people who have come together, and we're trying to tell young engineers what material science and engineering is all about. So, what is material science and engineering? Well, it's the study of the structure and properties of materials and you're going to help me with this today because you're going to join me by looking at the structure of some materials and uh, we've got lots of different materials in the microscope today um, some structures are quite big like when you think of like a building like a building's a structure right and you can see the structure of a building it's got pillars it's got windows and doors and a roof and that's quite easy to see and we can see other structures like a laptop and a mouse and a pencil and a pen, and they've got parts to them. But then when you start to get really, really small, um, you need some help to see the structure of some things. So when you start off with big things like a component, you can see that with your eye. Um, but if you want to zoom in, you might want to use a microscope and you might have a microscope in your school or in your like biology class maybe. But today we're going to use the a power of atoms and electrons to help us zoom in really, really small. And we need to understand um, some of these structures because it can give us different properties. And some of the properties are mechanical, like we've just seen with Chris Senna with his biscuit um, session, okay, where you can break things. So if something's bendy or if something's hard, um, how resistant it is. Right? Will it will it corrode if it's left out in the rain? Um, will it conduct electricity? Can we use it for wires? Can we see through it? That's another property. Um, does it reflect light or does it refract light? Could it like act like a prism and make a rainbow? All these different properties are controlled by how a material is made, and not just the size of the part, but how it's made inside. So to do that, we need to zoom in. And today we're going to zoom in lots. And this is my attempt on here to show you how much we're going to zoom in today. So there's somebody's eye, lovely blue eye. And this person with your eye, you can see if you had like um, a ruler in school or a ruler at home, you can see down to just underneath a millimeter, maybe half a millimeter, depends on how close you can get your eye or how bad your eyes are if you need glasses, okay? Um, if you want to zoom in a little bit more, five times better than your eye or 10 times better than your eye, then you need some kind of magnifying glass or maybe some glasses. 
But if you want to go smaller than that again, you need a microscope. And we've got lots of microscopes in all of our universities. And they look something like this, where you get really close to the sample, like within a couple of millimeters, they're really, really close. And then you can zoom in. So if your eye can see something this big, so if this was half a millimeter, right? So if that blue bar there was like a tiny little half millimeter, one of these, then your magnifying glass could see about a fifth of that, or maybe a tenth of that, depending on how thick the glass is, okay? And if you had a light microscope, then you could go down a hundred times smaller than that again. 0.5 of a micron. Look how small this is compared to that line, ready? See that tiny little mark there? That's how big you can see something with just using a light microscope. How cool is that? But this thing that I've got here today, this is not a light microscope. I'm not using light today. The lights are off inside here. I'm using electrons. And electrons are even smaller than light itself. Okay? And this is how much smaller we can go. So if this tiny little blue bar was 0 0.5 microns, right? So just look, look what that is in millimeters. It's 0 0.005 millimeters. This is how much we can zoom in today. So if that tiny little bar was this big, then this kind of machine or machines like this can see down to one nanometer, okay? That's very, very small, <laughs> okay? So let's have a look today. Um, we're gonna use electrons. And I'm going to use 20,000 volts. So that's, that's a lot of volts. That's 100 times more energy than what you get from the plug in your house or your school, okay? And the reason I'm going to use that is because I need to charge up my electrons. I need to give them loads and loads of energy, and then I'm going to shoot them at my samples like a laser, and I'm going to scan my laser across all of my materials. And to do that, I actually need to go to outer space inside my laboratory. So I'm going to use these type of things, these electrons, they're whizzing round. And then inside here, I've pumped out all of the air. So this is like space in here. And that means that the electrons can shoot down and hit my sample surface and scan across them like a laser. So that's enough about the science. Let's get and into the microscope and have a look at some of the cool materials. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna switch now to my different microscope picture. And you won't see anything to start with. Hopefully you can see that now. And you won't see much to start with. Um, it's just black, okay? I'm not zoomed in on anything. But hopefully, if this hasn't drifted too much, there we go. Can we see that on the screen? Can somebody give me like a thumbs up in the chat or something? It's good, Mark. Good. Thank you, Becky. So this is something very small. And hopefully, you'll have an idea of how small this is, because I'll tell you what it is in a second. But before I do, you can see Becky there now in the chat. I want you to see if you can guess what this might be. I'm just sorting out the brightness for you. Before you start, I'm going to give you some clues that might help you out. At the bottom of the screen, there we go. At the bottom of the screen, you can see this like lime green measurement bar. That shows you how much we zoomed in or how big that scale bar is on the screen okay so the whole width of this screen at the moment is just over one millimeter does anybody want to guess in the chat what it is i'm looking at here and you can see actually when i change the contrast and brightness can you see how slow the picture is to respond how slow it takes to go brighter or darker. That's the electron laser beam scanning across my surface. That's why this is called a scanning electron microscope. 
and we can zoom in, zoom, zoom, zoom. Oh, there's some answers coming in on the chat already. Well, I can't see the chat for some reason. So we're going to zoom in on here. Very, very small. I mean, it's got its own little texture on it. But I'll start to zoom out now, and hopefully you can see. These are definitely smaller than a millimeter. There's lots of them now, actually. They're quite smooth, they're a bit rounded. And I've got a fair few hundred of them on this material here. This is sand, boys and girls. This is sand from the beach at Swansea, okay? So just to sort of give you an idea of what we're looking at, that is sand from the beach at Swansea. And this is the amount of magnification we can go in. So let's choose a grain of sand. That was quite a big one there. And I'm gonna zoom in now, ready? Come and zoom in with me. Whoa! It kind of looks, kind of makes you a little bit sick, zooming in. Zoom, zoom, zoom into the sand. Now, this actually is, is a piece of sand, but it's not a piece of stone. OK, now sand is made up of pebbles and stone and material that's been ground down and down and down and actually turned quite smooth. You can see the surrounding pebbles, the surrounding bits of sand are quite smooth. But this sample here looks slightly darker. Um, this is a piece of bone. This might be, I don't know, a fish bone or something that's died, um, washed up on the beach. You can see it's got its own little structure and substructure. If we zoom in even further, you can see it's got some cracks on it. And you can see it's got this like layered structure, which makes the bone really, really super strong. Now, we've got lots of lots of opportunities actually around us to look at some cool things. And I know some of you have been on your, um, your I wouldn't say treasure hunt then, you've been on your, your hunt on the weekend. And there was some people asking in, uh, online to look at some bugs under the microscope. So I've gone and found some bugs for us. Um, the first bugs I found were actually in the sand. Um, so if I move my sample, you might be able to hear the microscope whirring away. These are bugs that we found in the sand. And you find these all over the place. These are little shell creatures that live in the sand. Um, sometimes they're called sand dollars. You can see this kind of looks like what you might expect to see. See this one here looks like um, a shell you could hold up to your ear when you go to the beach. And there would have been a little creature, a little sand crab or something living inside that shell um, before it got washed up onto the beach. Now, the cool thing about some of these shells is how they're actually made. I think this one here is really pretty. So we've got one ear in the middle. And again, as I zoom in, let me turn this to a faster scan. You can see when I zoom in, you can see the scale bar is getting smaller and smaller. And then you can see that these shells actually have a substructure. So let me just play around with this and focus it. If you zoom in really, really close, you can see that the shell is actually porous. Now, do we mean what? Do we know what porous means? Well, it means something's full of holes. Okay, it's got little tiny holes in it, which allows this animal to breathe actually through its shell. And if you wanted to, you could measure the size of these holes. Um, you could take something like um, a measurement here. Let's choose. I mean, that's the biggest one. Maybe we can choose this one. That's 5.8 microns big. So just to put that into perspective, that's 10 times smaller than the width of your hair on your head. So that's how small we can go in a microscope like this. We can actually go smaller again, but we won't go too crazy today. We've got lots of lots of different animals surrounding us as well. And you can zoom out, you see how pretty this, this sample is. You can see how the porosity isn't spread out evenly. There's some substructure to the shell itself, which is like a scaffolding that holds the shell together. And then it's got this porosity in between. 
Now we also find some other bugs laying around. Um, we've got one here. See if you can guess what this is. Let me zoom in a little bit first so you can guess what it is. We'll have our first proper guess now in the chat. I'm just moving my microscope into position. There we go. There's our first bug, proper bug. Now you can't really see much there. I'll have to zoom out a little bit. There's the head. Can you see all these little hairs? That's actually a little bit of dirt and contamination that's on the sample. And then we zoom out, we zoom out. You might be able to start guessing as to which bug this might be. I'll hold it there. It's quite hard with an electron microscope because we don't get any color information because we're not using light, remember, boys and girls, we're using electrons. And so we don't get any color. So we don't know if this is blue or red or orange, if it's got any spots on it, hint, hint. Anybody want to guess in the chat what, what this might be? So, this actually is a ladybird. And if I switch to the backscatter detector, hopefully, this will give us slightly different information. There we go. You can just about make out the pattern maybe on the, on the surface. So this is a, a ladybird. And the nice thing about this, this particular ladybird is it's got its wings still popping out the back. So if I zoom in on the wings, you'll be able to see the structure of the wings themselves. And the wings themselves are actually quite hairy. So as I'm zooming in here now, you can see the wings have got this little structure made up of tiny little hairs. Tiny, tiny little hairs on the ladybird's wing. Millions of them, right? Now, speaking of hairs, we've got the chance here now to look at another animal. And this animal is much more hairy than the ladybird. First of all, it looks a bit upside down, so I will flip it the other way. Ooh, definitely needs a haircut, clearly been in lockdown too long. And this is a moth. I'm sure you've all seen moths before. This is a moth that you would find uh, banging its head against the window potentially in the night. And you can see how hairy the moth is actually. And the cool thing about the moth, especially this sample here, is we can have a look at the eye of the moth. And as we zoom in, we can see that the eye for bugs like this is different to our eye. It's something called a compound eye. And it's made up of lots of little eyeballs all kind of working together. And normally, the human eye, we have our receptors inside our eyeball. But bugs like this, they have their receptors, individual receptors on the outside. And you can see them with an electron microscope. And they've got a very, very certain structure to them. Can you all see that, boys and girls? As you're zooming in, they're made up of little hexagons. Now, hexagons are quite a nice structure in nature because it's very, very efficient way of packing together um, things, different things. Does anybody know where we see hexagons? Any six-sided shapes in other parts of nature? You can see all the all the people from the school session that I did yesterday are probably shouting at Miss. Yeah, we see them in honeycomb structures. Yeah, um, and bubble wrap. Uh, it will. 
bubble wrap is more man-made, but in, in nature, we see these honeycomb structures because it's a very efficient way of packing things together into a small space. We actually see this type of structure in atoms in materials like titanium. So we've very, very similar structured and packed in atoms like this for metals, very similar to what we're seeing in nature. I've got another example of hexagonal structures. Just want a, another picture of this. This moth looks super cool. I'm going to slow it down. You can see the, the laser scanning a bit more slowly across the sample, cleaning up the sample image. So this eye is a third of a millimeter big, and these hairs are even finer. Do you think he's looking back at us? Yeah, maybe. Um, and so you can see as well, it's maybe got a little bit of dirt. This is probably pollen or something or some dust on the eyes. Uh, I had a wasp in here not so long back, and that was full of uh, pollen on its um, on the front. So if I show you another similar material that I've got in here now that has a, a honeycomb structure, I'm going to move on to a different part. And this material is, isn't a bug, um, but it is a natural material. Um, this is a cut through of a section of bamboo. And you can see a bamboo is a very strong material. Um, in some countries, they actually use bamboo to make scaffolding. So, you know, when you look at the side of a building and the builders are doing something, they're sort of, you know, putting a new roof on. In some countries, they use bamboo for scaffolding and they can go several stories high. And it's because bamboo is very lightweight, but it's very, very strong. And one of the things that make it lightweight is that once bamboo is, is chopped down and dried out, it's actually um, quite hollow. Not only is it hollow in the middle, let me zoom back out a second. Can you see this kind of circle in the center here? So not only is that normally full of water or, or some fluid, the actual structure of the bamboo itself is hollow. So if I zoom in on the side here and I focus the image for you, you can see now we've got that honeycomb structure again. Now, if I didn't tell you that that was bamboo, you might guess actually, boys and girls, that that was more like a bee's nest, wasn't it? Like a honeycomb structure, like honey. Um, and again, you get these five or six sided shapes. Now, if all of these tubes were the same size, they would predominantly be six sided shapes. Some of them are five. You might get the odd four in you every now and again, but most of these are six sided shapes because that's the most efficient way to, to pack in these tubes into the structure of the bamboo. And it actually makes it very, very strong then. So if you've got a crack or you've got some force applied to this material, that force is distributed evenly along this network. And you can see how lightweight it is. You can see if I zoom into a smaller area here, maybe, you can see it's mostly made up of holes, isn't it? It looks like bubbles that have all popped. I'll try a different uh, imaging mechanism here to see if the, the backscatter gives us better imaging. Maybe a little bit better. Now, the cool thing about this the different way of looking at something, because we're using electrons, um, we can actually get some information about how dense the material is. So you can see the bamboo here is looking a little bit gray. Um, whereas you've got some other regions here that look a bit brighter. So if I focus this region here now, you can see you might have some uh, contamination, little bits of stone, and these are showing up much denser or much heavier in elements, these little bits here. And we can use this type of scanning to identify then any contamination in our material. Okay, speaking of... Um, bubbles. I'm going to see now if I can find one of the requests 
from the students over the weekend, something that they found when they were looking for different materials. And hopefully it's up here. It's a structure that we see quite a lot in material science and engineering. It's not that bug, we'll come back to that bug in a second. Here we go, so I'll zoom in now. And I want you to try and guess, boys and girls, in the chat, or shout out to Miss if you're um, doing it via your school. I want you to try and guess what material I'm looking at there. What is this? Let me see if I can make the image a bit better. Now, it works better on the variable pressure. Oh, there we go. Does anybody want to guess what that might be? Oh, Amy, great guess in the chat. Anybody else want to guess? It kind of looks like bubbles again, doesn't it? And we've got that theme again where these bubbles are all sort of joined together. Some of them have got four sides. Some of them have got five sides. Some of them have got six sides. Yes, Vismuth, it's made from plastic. So even though I'm shooting... 20,000 volts at this material. I have to be very careful that I don't stay on you for too long because I will damage the, the material, even though I'm in something called variable pressure mode. Um, this is a sponge from the kitchen. Here we go. This is a squidgy sponge. And you can see the bit. Can you see the bit I've torn off there on the top? That's, the, that's what it looks like under a microscope. Now, the cool thing about a sponge like this is that um, the polymer, it's made from plastic, okay? And they aerate it. So they, they, they blow bubbles into it when this plastic is melted. And then those bubbles all pop. And when the plastic cools down, it keeps its shape and it goes quite nice and spongy, especially if you use a flexible plastic. Um, but the important thing about a sponge like this that you use in the kitchen is that when these bubbles pop, all the bubbles are kind of connected together which still makes it springy and spongy. And that's really important. So if you dip this now in the sink and you squeeze it and then you pull it out, that means that all those popped bubbles have contain water and then you can use it to wipe the dishes and clean your cups. And then you can squeeze out all the dirty water back in the sink. Now, not all forms are made like this. Some insulating forms, the bubbles aren't connected and they keep the air inside them. And the thing that makes insulating foam very insulating isn't the plastic or foam that it's made from, but the air that's trapped in between the bubbles. That's what makes our attic and our homes nice and nice and warm. So I'm going to show you a few more bugs, uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about um, surface structures. So I've got one more bug to show you which is this one. And I really like this one because this is, this is a leaf hopper bug. Now, you might have seen these if you have a picnic, you might have seen these leaf hopper bugs. Um, they're green. And when they ha sometimes they have like a little green triangular um, like shell to their outside. Now, these two uh, are upside down. Uh, they're on their backs. Um, so their kind of legs are in the air like this. OK, so if I can just have two minutes, I will try and make this a little bit brighter. There we go. In fact, I'll change a set in here on my microscope. Oh, no, it's gone. But now we're back. And then we can zoom in on a region here, which is really, really interesting. So I quite like these leaf hoppers because they've got cool structures to them. Zoom, 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 focus, focus, focus. And the cool structures that we're interested in as scientists are where their legs are. And they're, as the name suggests, what do you think a leaf hopper does? How does it get from one leaf to the next? Does anybody want to guess? It's called a leaf hopper, boys and girls. Anybody in the panelists, you want to guess what a leaf hopper does? Yeah, 
it, it hops between leaves, okay? And the cool thing about a leaf hopper is its back legs are really, really strong and it can jump really, really far in terms of how its uh, body weight, uh, it, sorry, the distance it can go in terms of its body weight. And that's because of the way the hip joints are made on the leaf hopper. So I'm zooming in slowly here now. What does that look like? It looks like almost like teeth on the hips of the leaf hopper. It looks weird. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. And then I'll focus the image there. Don't want to linger too long. So you can see the leaf hopper has got like teeth or a geared structure on its on its back legs. And that gearing structure, like gears in a car um, or gears on a lift, that can mean that it can it can open and close its hips really, really quickly. And I'm going to show you what we can do at Swansea and a very a lots of other places is we can 3D print then um, the structure that we just saw there. So here's the leaf hoppers hips, and this is one leg. This is the other leg. Now, which way around do these go? Let me show. Sure I got these the right way. There we go. And these actually connect together like this. Let me come to the camera like that. And that means that these hips, uh, I mean, you, you can't see that, but it feels really smooth. It feels really, really smooth. And so the leaf hopper can sort of go whoop, like that with its hips. And then like a frog can jump from one leaf to the next really, really, really quickly. And each of these um, teeth on this geared structure, each of them is slightly curved. And so we've copied this structure um, for different gearing for different vehicles. Okay, so um, it means that there's much less friction uh, and much less wear on the parts then. So we're borrowing what Mother Nature has done uh, and we're applying it to uh, engineering problems. And this is some of the bio inspirational materials that we're starting to see now uh, in materials engineering. So let's get back to the microscope because I want to show you another cool bio inspired material. It's one of my favorites and it's something that I've worked on as part of somebody's PhD. Um, and this was a lady that I helped. Um, she was looking at this material. Um, and again, uh, this is something that we find on the beach in, in Swansea. So there's a bit of a theme here. Uh, we do study other things, by the way. Most I, I study metals, but um, this is something you might be familiar with. And just give me a minute to get it in focus because it's a slightly different height to everything else. It's a little bit taller. And I might put a bit more scan rotation on here just to square it up a bit. So this structure is like, what does that look like? You can definitely see there's something going side to side and you can definitely see maybe then you've got some columns going up and down. Um, this is a structure that we find washed up on the beach in Swansea. And this is what the inside of cuttlefish looks like, cuttlefish bone. Um, you might, if you've got birds at home or you know someone who's got, um, uh, that keeps birds, sometimes you, you can see cuttlefish on the side of their cages uh, and you can use this, the, the birds use this to clean their beaks. Now, the cool thing about cuttlefish, the bones itself like this and the shells are very, very structured. They've got this like layered structure from top to bottom. Um, and there's lots, I'm zooming out now. There's lots and lots of layers. Can you see? Each of these is one layer and each of these layers then are supported by columns, just like, like a block of flats in a big building. And there's a shell structure on one end, I think, is it this side? Yeah, there's a shell structure then at the top which seals it all off. Now, the cool thing about this type of structure is if this cuttlefish gets uh, damaged from the outside or bumped against a rock or a predator tries to take a bite out of it, um, 
then one of these layers will break and it will fail and collapse. But the rest of the layers stay intact. The load doesn't get transferred to the next layer down. That layer will break on its own. And everything else underneath will be fine. And it takes another bump or even more force or even more pressure for the next layer to break and so on and so on and so on. So if you wanted to get and damage the real heart, the inside of this cuttlefish, you've got to get through all these different layers. So this is like really, really clever body armor for this animal. You have to get through all these different layers um, to cause really significant harm to the animal, okay? And these layers can then regrow as well if they do get damaged. And so we see this type of structure in packaging, yeah? We could see this in, um, in a cardboard box, for example. So if you've got a cardboard box anywhere near, have a look at it. You'll find it's made up of two sheets of card and then it'll have a wavy piece of card in between. And that wavy piece of card then is designed to sort of flex and squash a little bit and protect what's inside the box. But imagine if you put lots and lots and lots of pieces of card, well, that's what the cuttlefish has gone and done here. Where else might you use that kind of structure, boys and girls? Pop your answers in the chat. Where else would you use this kind of structure? So we've got a project on this running at Swansea at the moment where you want to have some kind of structure that's going to help you, boom, absorb an impact or, boom, stop you from taking some damage. Oh, Chris is saying car bumpers. Yeah, good guess. Corrugated cardboard. Sports equipment, yeah. Bike helmets is what the, the project's currently working on. So having a bike helmet like this, what you can do now is you can scan the shape of your head in a scanner, and then you can 3D print, just like what we've done with these, your own helmet, and you can make a structure like this on the inside, and that will be your very own helmet. It only fits you, and it'll be super, super absorbent if you do come off your bike. Okay, I got one more sort of biological sample to show you. And that's something that was given to me. Amy, these samples are in this machine right now. Yeah. So um, they are now being analyzed. And that's why some of these materials I can't stay on for very long. Because um, when you're looking at these type of biological materials, when you're shooting 20,000 volts at them, uh, they will damage the material. If you shoot 20,000 volts at a metal, it will conduct the material away, it conduct the energy away. But I'm having to use clever systems in here now to stop these materials from charging. So do you want to see? Yeah, I can show you the... Um, if I stop sharing and I do a new share. There you go. Can you see that, Amy? That's the carousel that I have inside the SEM at the moment. These are some of the materials we've been looking at. And this carousel is live. So I've taken this picture beforehand. And if I double click on any of these, it'll take me to that sample inside the SEM. So as you can see, I've got about 15 different ones in the SEM at the same time. Now, we don't normally work like this. Um, it's quite challenging to work like this because as you can see, I've got metals. So these ones here, can you see the ones on the bottom three? Those are all metallic samples. Normally those are quite easy to look at. Whereas bugs and leaves and hair and bits of sand, they're quite challenging to look at. So normally we wouldn't put these two types of materials in at the same time, but it does take about 10 minutes to swap a sample out every time because don't forget inside this chamber here, there's no air. It's like space in here, it's under vacuum. And that's because air particles are too big. The electrons won't get through the air um, down to the, the sample. Good question. So I'm gonna show you one more sort of biological sample then. And you can see, you probably can't hear it because I've got the microphone on my ear, but it's, it buzzes away when the stage is moving around. And this is something that Chris gave me. So Chris, who introduced me at the start, 
sent me this in the post this week, and I haven't looked at this before. So you're going to be looking at this with me for the first time today. This is something that Chris did a video on in the past called a lotus leaf. And the lotus leaf has got this wonderful trick. Um, the lotus leaf has got a way to clean itself by being something called hydrophobic. So when you're phobic, when you've got a phobia of something, it kind of means you, you don't like it, right? You, you're a bit scared of it maybe. Um, and so hydrophobic means that this leaf doesn't like water. And I've got a sort of experiment here that I'm gonna try and show you. Uh, I'll try not to make a mess in my lab, but Chris has sent me some lotus leaves uh, in the post. Um, they kind of made it, Chris. Okay, I do apologize. Uh, they kind of made it in one piece. So here's one of his lotus leaves. And the, the surface of a lotus leaf um, is very, very textured and is actually quite porous. It's got holes in it. Um, so that when you try to, I hope this works, when you try to pour water then on a lotus leaf, the water doesn't stick to the leaf. So hopefully you can see this on camera. Here we go. And this is called hydrophobic material. Oh no, it went on my jeans. Can you see that the, the bead of water is kind of just running off? I'll put loads on, ready? I, I shouldn't do this in the lab, but here we go, here we go. Ah, it's gone off the floor. And look at that. The leaf itself is still dead dry. None of that water stayed on the leaf. And that's because that leaf is hydrophobic and it's because of the surface structure of the leaf. And so let's have a look. Do we think boys and girls that it must be dead smooth, right? So that water wasn't sticking to the leaf. The water, the leaf itself must be dead smooth so that the water just runs off straight. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought before I start looking at this material. But it's not though. If we look at it under the microscope, you can see it's got these little dots on it. So that's a bit strange. Here's the leaf and we'll zoom in a bit more. Oh, okay, well, it's definitely not smooth. Let's zoom in a little bit more again. Okay, and then in between these dots, it's got even more dots. So let's, I mean, how these are very small dots too. Oh, wow. This is one of the smallest things we've looked at today. So the cool thing about the lotus leaf is the surface of the leaf itself is actually quite textured. It's quite rough. I mean, it's not rough when you feel it with your hand, but it's rough when you look at it under a microscope like this. And it's also quite porous. And that texture means that the pores can hold air. And it's the air then and the roughness that turns the water into little droplets. And it doesn't allow any surface tension to form. And the contact angle then means that the water just runs straight off. How clever is that? The cool trick about it is though, that when the water runs off, it picks up any dirt that's on the leaf and takes it with it. So when these are out in the rain and the, the water's all falling on the leaves, it's self-cleaning. It's like every time it rains, the lotus leaf has a little bath and cleans itself. Or oh, Chris is saying in the chat, you can actually get lotus leaves online. So you can try this at home or in your classrooms. And Savoy cabbage, also has a similar effect. So maybe the, if you've got a Savoy cabbage and looked at it under a microscope, it must have a similar uh, microstructure, right? Okay, I wanna show you one more thing and then we're gonna move on to the metal samples. Would the lotus leaf get wet if you rub the bumps off the leaf with your fingers before wetting it? I, it probably would. If you were to remove some of that surface structure or fill in the pores with some wax off your fingers, then it would be harder for the leaf to um, reject that water um, droplet. Good question. 
Yeah, so Amy's saying now in the pan in the to the panelists that have you seen those videos on YouTube where people can get like a spray now and they spray their clothes with a similar material, and then you get a, somebody chucks like a big bucket of mud on them, and then the mud just kind of washes straight off. Now, this is a really important idea, particularly for things like um, glass panels. So um, if you imagine big buildings now, you can get something called self-cleaning glass. Um, but more importantly, for the glass panels now that go on solar panels, because if the glass of a solar panel gets dirty, um, the efficiency of the solar panel goes down really, really far. So you have to spend a lot of time sort of cleaning the solar panels. So any sort of material like this that can help it clean itself is really, really useful. Okay, so before we move on to the metal samples, I'm just going to show you this one more sort of, um, I wouldn't say biological material, but it's certainly not um, a metal. But I like this material because um, it's got an interesting structure that we do see in metals. Does anybody want to guess at what this is under the microscope? Oh, Vivian, great guess. Very, very close. Very, very close. They're little cubes of, well done, Vizma. They're little cubes of sugar. Okay, so these are little sugar cubes. Uh, and sugar, like this, when it um, solidifies, forms crystals. And you can see some of these crystals kind of form on their own. Um, some of these crystals, can you see these two here, have, have formed and they've grown like into each other. They're like sort of one crystal started down here growing and that crystal down there has grown and they've kind of met each other and carried on growing um, and formed this kind of interesting shape. Now, if you were to grow a sugar crystal on its own very, very slowly, eventually that sugar crystal would be one big crystal that you could sort of eat like a big I don't know, sugar cube, right? But that's not what we get normally. We get normally loads of little crystals like this. Um, and we get structures like this in lots of metals and crystalline materials. So when a, a material crystallizes like this and forms these little crystals, um, when they join together, you form a little boundary between the two. And we've kind of seen this today with our bubble structures. When you have one bubble and it meets another bubble, it kind of has a little straight line. It has a little boundary between the two. Well, this is what happens in metals. Uh, I don't know if this is going to work today, but uh, let me show you what I mean. Go to this sample over here. So I've got a piece of steel in here and it's been polished um, really, really smooth, like a mirror finish. And then it's been attacked with acid. And that acid then sort of roughens up the sample surface. And I'm kind of hoping we, it's roughened it up enough and etched it enough that we can see the grain structure. It might not work in variable pressure mode. I might have to change the microscope around a little bit, but we'll give it a go. Oh, nearly. You can me nearly see it. Stick with me, boys and girls. It's coming. You can see now, though, that it's much harder to image the metal because I'm in a slightly different mode compared to what I'd normally be in. It's because I've looked at uh, all the bugs and things today, but it doesn't matter. We'll make it work. I just have to realign a few things. There we go. And we uh, spend a lot of time actually as metallurgists looking at these types of structures. So I've got a few of my uh, researchers uh, looking at the internal structures of these materials. And if I zoom out now, hopefully you can see what I'm on about. Oh, nearly, 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 nearly. Let's change the backscatter mode. Oh, 
Oh, that's promising. It's too bright. I'm, sh I'm sorry if I've destroyed all your screens. No, I don't think it's going to work on that. We'll move to a different metal sample. But what you would normally see uh, in something like that would be this type of structure. You'd see something where each individual metal crystal grain has grown on its own and then joined up to bump into another crystal. So when you see a, a block of metal, like a chunk of metal, it's not actually one chunk of metal. It's lots of little, almost like sugar crystals joined up together. And when the light bounces against those different crystals, depending on how those crystals solidified, in what direction the atoms are lined up, it reflects the light slightly differently. So when I'm sort of moving it around in front of the webcam like that, you can see that the different crystals are turning different colors of gray. That's because each crystal has got its own little orientation. And that just happened to be an orientation that it was when it started to solidify. Okay, last few samples then. I'm very conscious that we're running out of time. Um, we've been talking about breaking biscuits today in some of the previous sessions. So I wanted to show you some biscuits, not some biscuits, sorry, some broken samples, but these aren't biscuits. You wouldn't want to eat these boys and girls. Um, these are metal samples that we break. And um, we break these all the time uh, in all of our labs, I'm sure. Um, these are, things that we call uh, a tensile test where we've pulled the sample apart. And the cool thing about these is when you pull a material apart, it tells you a lot about the properties of the material. There we go. So looking at this part now, um, straight away, I can tell that this part is, it wasn't very hard. And it when it broke, it probably went a bit bendy first when it broke. So this is something called fractography. And it's like a dark art. It's like magic when you're looking at the materials. Um, so let me show you this one. There we go. This is a fracture surface. And we spend a lot of time actually as metallurgists breaking things and then looking at the fracture surface. Um, because it tells you a lot about the internal structures of the material. So first of all, you can see this is quite a ductile sample. This is a piece of brass. And you can see it's got holes in it. These are ductile voids. And if you zoom in even further, it, some of it almost looks quite spongy, like it's been ripped apart like some warm bread. Can you see this region down here? Really, really sort of ductile then it's been ripped apart. Now contrast that to something that's harder. So we've got a high carbon steel over here. This would be our last sample. This is much harder. And first of all, you can see this very circular. So it didn't hardly bend when it broke and it didn't hardly thin at all. And the structure of the, the surface itself is quite flat. And you can see hardly any uh, ductile voids. And so you can confidently say that this material, this part probably snapped. Okay, it was very, very brittle and probably snapped. And if you're really, really careful, sometimes you can spot where the crack started from and which way uh, it propagated. I'm running out of time. I had loads more to show you. But I think we'll call it a day there. I'm going to stay on for five minutes um, to answer any questions. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, I think this has been recorded so you can watch it back again. But I'm happy to stay on for five minutes now and answer any questions that you might have. Back to you, Chris. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. It's fantastic seeing um, the FCM online and live. I'm just glad it worked. I was really kind of, there were so many things that could have gone wrong, but uh, really happy it worked. Uh, I thought the lotus leaf looked pretty good on it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, I think, what was your favourite, boys and girls, in the chat? What would you say? Did the panellists have any favourites as well? 
I've got, I've got, a, I'm going to put my favourite one back on the screen. It has to be the moth, doesn't it? Yeah, I was going to say, I think, yeah, Cass has gone for the moth as well. Um, I really, really like the moth. I think, I think I was quite surprised actually at how well it imaged um, and how it didn't really drift that much. So really, really impressed. Um, this is what a quarter of a million pounds uh, buys you. It buys you a, a microscope that doesn't burn your biological samples. <laughs> Fizz was saying his favorite was the sponge. Um, yeah, the sponge is a great one because it's it's very similar to the structures you see in metals. So that's my sort of area of expertise. Um, the sponge sort of network that you get um, is very similar to the, the network of grains and grain boundaries that you have in some metals and materials. Yeah, that's definitely my favorite one. Should we, I'm gonna do a capture, a capture of a screen, a nice image of this before we finish. Yeah, I have to put, put that on Twitter and Instagram. It is definitely, yeah. <laughs> Daniel saying in the chat, it's the moth with the lockdown hairdo. I think, <laughs> you know what, I think that's probably going to be the name for this image, right? Yeah. That's, it's, yeah, definitely it. No, it's just that's a lot of fine surface structure you can see in the SEM. It's just amazing. It's a whole new world. I mean, as soon as you use an instrument like this, even your camera phone, boys and girls, if you, if you start looking around your house, start looking at different structures of materials out in the garden, et cetera, um, you can sort of, you know, get up close. You can buy little um, lenses now, actually, that will fit on your camera phone and, and will help you zoom in and create, turn your camera phone into your own personal microscope. So yeah, got one of those. Uh, that's these, it. So there's yeah. Chris one there. You can just clip that onto your back of your phone and you can have a quarter million pound microscope in your pocket. Actually, there's um, a video about these on our um, YouTube channel as well. Brilliant. So no, they they are great. They're sort of probably about eight pounds or something. So it's not too bad. Oh, th these. Oh, um, the clip on the microscope wouldn't be an out of space. It wouldn't stay on out of space. We're not quite. It's a bit tongue in cheek me saying that that we're, we've we've made space in the microscope. We're not quite as down uh, at the pressures that you get in out in outer space, like the sort of vacuum that we have. We're down to about um, 10 to the minus four, minus, minus five bar, but um, it's about halfway to space then. There you go. But yeah, with, with the um, clip-on lenses, you just have a look for just, just clip-on microscope lenses. And then if you haven't got a um, smartphone, you can buy little travel microscopes for about sort of 20, 30 pounds as well, which are also pretty cool for getting out and having a look around the garden, around the home, just the awesome structures that are around yeah so my, my experience when i was in school chris i don't know what it was like for you was that um, we only ever used to have microscopes in our biology class and um, we only mm. ever used to look at like thin uh, glass slides of things um it wasn't really until i started doing material science and engineering that i put other things under the microscope and as soon <laughs> as i did it was like wow i didn't know that that looked like this and i didn't know that all these different structures existed it was so cool yeah, and it's just amazing sort of in nature how it just uses surface structure for a whole variety of things. Yeah, I mean, when you look at how efficient uh, Mother Nature has found all these efficiencies that we're, we're kind of borrowing now as researchers, we let Mother Nature do all the sort of <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years of research. And then we sort of take that and then we apply it to some engineering problems. So, yeah, like uh, Mother Nature's doing all our research and development for us. <laughs> Uh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, aluminium drinks cans are really strong, but if you cut them, the metal tears quite easily. Yeah, the, 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 a drinks can is quite... Um, it, it's, so the, the actual metal that's made from a, a can of pop like this is very, very thin. Um, and that's to minimise the amount of material you need to make a can, because we make millions and millions of cans a year, uh, and make them cheaper. Uh, the actual strength that comes from a sealed can of Coke or a can of Pepsi, other, other drinks are available, um, 
is it comes from the the sort of pressure contained in it as soon as you break that can open it does become quite easy to kind of crush the can but compare that to like a can of beans or dog food now a can of beans or kind of dog food is much much harder than a can of pop and that's because um, if you look at a can of, of, of beans now, you can see it's actually crinkled down the side. And those ribs actually give it added structure. And so, yes, the, 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 the metal is actually a little bit thicker, but the, it's the structure that's added to it that gives it its rigidity as well. Good yeah, question, George. Thank you. At this point, magic. Yeah, see, put the crinkled look on there. There you go. So I suppose this is why it's sort of material science and engineering, that you put the material as aluminium and the engineering gives it those ribs. So when you've got a, if, if that's like a tin of beans or a tin of soup, by the way, boys and girls, the, not just the structure of the tin itself, but the chemistry that the metal is made out of actually goes into how the soup or the beans taste. So when the manufacturers put baked beans or they put soup into their tins, um, they have to think very, very carefully about the metal that the can is made out of because you don't want it to react with the food and make the food taste horrible. Awesome. Cool. Is there, has anyone else got any questions before we go off? Because I've seen we've overrun a bit. I think it's just me and Chris are having a chat now. Aren't we? <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, thank you very much, Mark.